message. Mm -hmm. You can't access the real stuff um, without the language. So in Israel, of course, um, you know, the level of discourse is, is much higher in these places because people are textually adept. Yeah, like the, the Torah is a very challenging book. It's not instant access. And the thing. harder you work, the greater the reward. And the life that it prescribes is a challenging life. It's, I, I, I would say, as a, as a convert, convert to, to Judaism, that Orthodox Judaism is the most demanding of the world's religions. And uh, the most difficult, the most challenging. And, and among all the, the mitzvot, the commandments of the Torah, living, living in Israel is, is a real challenge for us. It's so much easier to live in the diaspora, to live you know, where we were born and raised. But like, the greater the struggle, the greater the reward, right? Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, it is a, it is, um, it's much easier to think of these things in the Eastern, you know, in the Eastern way. I mean, it's a discipline. Mm -hmm. That's what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be. Um, it's supposed to be a, a path and a journey. Um, you know, it's like a, it's like the midrash it says about Moshe that he reached the forty ninth level of greatness of understanding of illumination. <laughs> so they say, well, what, you know, if was, so what was the next? What would happen at the fiftieth level? So the Hasidic writers say the fiftieth level is actually the lowest, the forty, the lowest level of the next, <laughs> the next series, and in fact, that's how they explain, um, you know, the Ramchal, the Tzato, says this very, very beautifully about, um, you know, what we call, you know, what will happen in the messianic time, spirituality, physicality, all of these questions. So he says we don't even have comprehension of these ideas. What, what to Adam was the physical, he says. Right? And then Adam fell away. To Adam, what to Adam was the physical is the highest level of what to us is the spiritual. So there are planes and planes of spiritual life and understanding that um, you know we can't even begin. We can't even comprehend. We haven't. We haven't gotten to a point where we can understand it. You know, it's like um, you ever go into a, like. You ever, I had to take like physical chemistry and you know, mm -hmm. sort of like modern physics. To, for medical school, and right. I tell you, it was like, you know, it was kind of like, it was amazing, and at the same time, it was kind of like that Far Side cartoon, you know, blah blah blah, ginger. Like I got, a, there were occasional words that I got in there, but the people who actually understand this stuff, it's like, you know, the whole world is it's like the, or to take the discourse down, it's like that last scene in the Matrix, in the first Matrix movie. I haven't seen the Matrix. Oh really? Oh, actually, I did see it, but I didn't get it, so I don't remember. Well, at the, in the very last moment of the first movie, and that was the only thing that was valuable in the whole, the other ones were terrible, um, he sees the word, he can see, he starts to see the world in code. He starts to see it in numbers and letters. Okay. Which is what the, our mystics say, if we could see the world, we would see it in letters and work in, like that. Why is there so much trash in Israel? I'm really disappointed in that. I've never been in such a trashy first world country. There's just like piles of trash everywhere. What's up with that? You know, some of us just didn't notice it. No, look, it's a poor country. It's not, uh, you can't assume that, uh, that um, Americans always go everywhere and they think everything has to be America. It's, uh, there's, it's poor. I mean, look, they're try economically, people are just trying to survive. Um, though, I suppose, on the other hand, one, one might say that um, certain areas are, are disgusting. <laughs> I couldn't believe how much trash there was as we drive around in the two-week Jewish Federation tour in 2000. When were you lost in Israel? But all I'm going to say is, oh, 2002. When I, oh, okay. But all I can say is that, you know, I was there for that, there was a period of time during the Rabin years, when peace looked like it was going to happen, the economic situation improved. Um, and you know, it was a whole, it was amazing for a couple of years there. Suddenly all that famous, like, nastiness, and people were nice on the road, people were uh, much better behaving one another. You know, you know, this brings me back to the post-Holocaust thing, you know. Those of us who grew up in that kind of environment, mm -hmm. we understand mm -hmm. this, where, you know, 
you, you hold on to every scrap of, uh, of turnip because you don't know if you're going to have food again. It, put, it makes you think, you live your life a different way than people who live in a comfortable existence who aren't worrying every moment about their, about their, uh, about their survival. So, you know, it, what, what happened is, you know, it used to be that, like, you had to compete for every, you know, in Israel, everybody would run around everybody else because, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't know if you got to the gate, they would close it and you wouldn't be able to, like, cast your check or, or survive. Mm -hmm. um, but when the, when the economy got better, um, people calm down. There, there is a life of third world desperation. Desperation, great word. That um, that makes it very unpleasant for people like us who are used to, you know, having our, you know, even if you hit rock bottom, there's always WalMarts. <laughs> right. You know, where you can afford, even a, even in miserable situation, you can afford to live. Um, so you have to just keep that in mind. And I think, you know, where were you living during the Second Intifada? Uh, I was there. I was in, in uh, Yerushalayim. I was in Yerushalayim, yeah. And, and then it, after that, I was in Givat Shmuel for the when the did, second intifada really kicked in. Did that have anything to do with you leaving Israel? Well, I don't want to get into that. Okay. For personal. What was it like to live there? It was harsh. I mean, you know, look, uh, I'd been there with my with my babies at, mm -hmm. at an ice cream store in Petah Tikva. Um, a week later, it was targeted and it was blown up, and people, children were killed. So you know, you lived in a siege mentality. You didn't, you know, you were always. There were always soldiers in arms and stuff like that. One of the kids, one of the, the sister of one of our slam people, Malki Roth, was killed in the bombing in Yerushalayim. Fifteen-year-old girl. So I mean, you know, it was horrible. The slam actually ended because of the Second Intifada. Because we we had it in uh, in a place called, in a wonderful place, a beautiful place called Tmol Shilshom, mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of Jerusalem, run by a wonderful guy named David Ehrlich. A uh, beautiful place where there is, it's, it was like a pub where you went out on dates, but it was a literary place. So they had famous uh, poets and writers talking about their work. So we held our slam there for for a while. And um, it ended because um, that was the area that kept getting bombed, and we couldn't, people wouldn't show up. So uh, we just we just called it off because we, we just didn't have a turnout. It was too dangerous to go. Do you believe that Jews are God's chosen people? You know, that question in English is such a, uh, so loaded, it's not, it's not what Amsagula means. Keep going. So we'll leave it at that. I mean, uh, we were going to talk about this week's Parsha, we can right. come back and do right. that, that right. Parsha. Right. But, um, you know, we were, the, we revealed a message. Has, has I don't know, you know, the question, when you say God's chosen people, that's, that's a phrase that has a lot of, um, you know, 2,000 years of misreadings and, you know, all kinds of political and other, and primarily re met readings put on it by particularly the hostile cultures around. So I think, first of all, there's no faith that does not believe that. Yeah, every group. Every, that every group. That it's valuable. Every group. Even I mean, forgetting one, faith. Every group. Have to, you know, Chinese, it's, Japanese, it's, every group. It's the anti Semitism two step. You know, you have to believe, you have to like, you can't say anything good about your faith without, like, universalizing it. It can't also be... But the fact of the matter is, you know, I think people are allowed to believe that what they do is good. It does not imply that it has to be a ne uh, negative comment towards everybody else. Right. And I'm far away from that kind of... Uh, I'm getting at, do you see the world differently today than 10 years ago because of events like the Second Intifada and 9-11 and the explosion of Jew hatred and America hatred in the world? In the last I grew up in a years. Holocaust environment, so right. I don't know. This is so nothing it's compared it's to right. uh, this is small. Uh, small change. There was a time when they were, you know, killing people on sight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is the it is the evolution of a long history of um, demonization. It has nothing to do with actual Jews, actual mm -hmm. texts. This is um, you know, it's a very good book by Leotard on this. Talks about Jews and Jews, small J and big J. How do you spell this guy's name? Leotard, mm -hmm. L Y O T A R D. Okay. You know there is a, a myth. There's a mythic Jew, which is a um, which is this demon mm -hmm. that, that has a that um, that has nothing to do with anything that we either do or say or believe. I mean, obviously, you know, there was was nothing 